Let me pray. Lord, again, we just thank you uh, for what you're doing and what you're doing in this room and pray that you would set people free and guide them and pray that you'd help me to communicate whatever you want me to communicate today. Thank you for your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, anybody here ever go trapping? You go to tra- a couple people have gone trapping. When why? Trapping. Trapping. For animals, furs, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I have never, I think it's a dumb thing to do, but you know, it's something that some people do. Um, but when I was going to school, elementary school, I think, some of my f- guy friends, they would say, yeah, I was out, I was checking my traps out and stuff like that. I'm thinking, who wants to get up as early as you got up to check traps? I don't know. But they trapped, and they were trapping, I don't know what you all trapped, but they trapped muskrat. That's what I remember them trapping. And they talked about the price of the pelts or whatever and how that went down. And then it's like, that's interesting. They trap these things. And you know what I never saw? I never went to church on a Sunday morning and saw a woman wearing muskrat. <laughs> I never saw a woman wearing muskrat. Like, hey, I really like your coat. Is that muskrat? Somehow wearing rat <laughs> it just doesn't work. You know what I mean? But I guess somebody wears it. I don't know. But they used to trap. Now, what part of the animal gets caught in the trap if you're trapping muskrat? Foot, leg, foot, right? If Satan was out to trap people, is he? (laughs) What part of our body would he go for? There's a variety of answers you could give. In my opinion, there's only one. The mouth. Traps the mouth. It just messes with the mouth. Because we can say some things that are just damaging, devastating. Like I've been talking about relationships can be destroyed. And, and one of the primary ways we can destroy damaged relationships is with our big mouths. Right? Well, I had a video last week. Do you remember the video from last week? It featured a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Actually, you never saw the mother-in-law because it's estrangement. But with Kevin and Amanda had this issue with Kevin's mother. And Kevin's mother said some things that offended her, Amanda. She was very upset and outraged. But Kevin, he was caught in the middle. He said, he downplayed it. He said, ah, it's not that big a deal. And then one day he went to talk to his mother, found out, took down notes about how she really felt about his wife. And he foolishly put the note in his closet and Amanda discovered it later and had proof. Now that you're shaking your head, no, yes, this is what happened. And found proof of what the mother-in-law actually thought of the daughter-in-law and all the wheels fell off. It's a tremendous estrangement. And you know, Damage were done, was done by the things that the two people said. We can do serious damage with our mouths. And Satan wants to trap us often with our mouths. And I want to talk about a story in the scripture where Jesus, an attempt was made to trap Jesus' mouth. One of the things that makes it so difficult is that when I say something to you that's hurtful or offensive... I can't pull it back in. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever wanted to take back the words that you expressed? Anybody here ever say anything you wish you could take back the words, right? I wish I could take back the words. Have you ever succeeded in taking back the words? Uh Uh-uh. You can't take back the words. Sometimes you say things and it's like it's done. And you can't undo it. And those words have unintended consequences. And often... I say something and you say something and I twist it my way and you twist it your way and I'm offended, you're offended and I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't forgive you for that and you can't forgive me for that and and sure enough, 15 years later, we're still not talking to each other, right? I want to talk about the traps that we can fall into with our mouths and attempt and an attempt that was made on Jesus' life in the scripture to trap his mouth. Here we go. It, the story is found in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, and, and here's how it begins. It says, Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to 
trap Jesus. They actually were trying to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. The plan was, we're going to trap Jesus. Now, they were actually planning this. I think Satan plans to trap me. Do you think that's true? I just, thought, I just paused on that one. Do you think Satan would like to trap me? What, I'm a pastor. Could I do serious damage to my ministry, to the ministry that God has given me with my mouth? For sure. Do you think Satan would like to trap me? Do you think he'd like to trap you? Yeah. Okay. So here we go. It says, the Pharisees met together to plant, trap Jesus into saying something for which he was, would be arrested, could be arrested. And then they come. I hate these next words. Just the way they, they are. Has anybody ever kissed up to you and you, they were phony as a $3 bill? How do you feel about that phoniness? Oh, you're so wonderful. You know what I mean? This is, this is what's going on in this story. They're, oh, Jesus, you're wonderful. Can I polish your halo for you, Jesus? It's just ridiculous. This is just ridiculous. Teacher, they said, they don't respect him as a teacher. Don't even go there. Yo, they should have started the script. Yo, Jesus. But instead they say, Jesus, oh, holy one. Jesus, they said, we know how honest you are. <laughs> we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. Oh, you're so truthful, Jesus. We respect you. You're impartial and don't play favorites. Oh, man. It's just insincere. Now tell us what you think about this. They're setting him up. Here's the trap. Think about what, tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it right to pay taxes or not to Caesar? Now, just out of curiosity, does anybody have any opinions about taxes? <laughs> what are you laughing about? I guess that's a yes. Is that a yes? Yes, that's a yes. You have an opinion about it. Anybody here have an opinion about Pennsylvania property taxes? Because the politicians have been, came, I don't know how many years they've been saying, we're going to fix property taxes, right? And then what I think about them fixing, now I'm going to say a little opinion, shouldn't, but I will. I think they're never going to change. Or if they do, this is what I think. If they change property taxes, reduce property taxes, what are they going to do then? They raise other taxes. What's the difference? Don't even bother. You know, who cares? Whatever you do, it doesn't matter. But we all have opinions about taxes. Anybody here have a, a, opinions about the IRS? Anybody have an opinion about the IRS? Anybody have an opinion about being audited? Anybody have an opinion about how the government spends our money? You have an opinion about that. Hey, don't go off the deep end on me, okay? This is just setting us up for a conversation here. It's nothing. Okay, do you have an opinion about how they use the money? Do you have any opinion about the uh, deficit? How about the debt? What's our debt number right now? 31 trillion. I thought it was more than I owed. I, I just thought it was more than I owed. Do you have an opinion about how they, what they should do about that problem? Yes, we have an opinion about that. Okay, Jesus was fully man, fully God, fully human, fully divine, right? Did Jesus have an opinion about taxes? No, he didn't. Hold it. He was human, right? To be human means you have an opinion about taxes. <laughs> it's, it's inherent. I mean, he was, he was tempted in every way that we're tempted. He was truly, absolutely human. Did Jesus prefer chocolate ice cream or vanilla? Well, he had a preference. He had an opinion. He had an opinion. He was a human being. It's the essence of humanity to have an opinion about things. Jesus had an opinion about the tax system of the Roman Empire. I'm sure, I suspect, I believe he had an opinion. What's Jesus' opinion about the tax system of the Roman Empire? You don't know. No, no, you don't know what his opinion is. He didn't express it. Here's how he fields the question. Somebody was anticipating over there how he fielded the question. So he says, they say, hey, what's your opinion? This is the next line of scripture in uh, verse 18. It says, but Jesus knew their evil motives. He knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said, why are you trying to trap me? That's the thing that jumped out at me today. He, he, he knew that they were trying to trap him. That's a problem I have. I don't always know before I speak 
that this is a potential trap. I don't always have an awareness of that. Do you? And I'm not saying that the other person that I'm talking to is necessarily trying to trap me. That's not the point. I, I just don't always have an awareness myself whether about the fact that this is a trap, this could be a problem for me here. So I think Jesus had an opinion about taxes. I also think he had an opinion about lots of other things. Do you know what, just out of curiosity, do you know what my opinion about cats is? How about mayonnaise? Yeah, I hate mayonnaise. I hate cats. I, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of taxes. Uh, cats, cats. I'm not a big fan of taxes either for that matter. But I mean, Jesus had opinions about cats and ice cream and mayonnaise, and yet he didn't express his opinion about that. As I don't know what he thought about cats. Maybe because the Heavenly Father made him, he liked them, but I, I mean, he just had to. I, I don't know why he would, but he, I guess maybe he liked them. I don't know. But this is what it says in the, in the scripture in Proverbs. It says, a truly wise person. That's good. Anybody want to be a truly wise person in the room? Six people have the wisdom to want to be a wise person. That makes sense. A, a, a truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even-tempered. What does the word even-tempered mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean reactionary. Any of you reactionary? Somebody says or does something and you react to it. What's an even-tempered person? Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. They're just, they don't, they don't react. One time I was talking to somebody, they said, I don't think I ever said this publicly before, but I was talking to somebody in a certain context and the person said, you know what, Randy, I'd like to have the experience sometime of killing somebody. And uh, I said, well, that, that's a very interesting thought. <laughs> so they said, they didn't kill me, it's all good. But actually somebody says, people say all kinds of things to me. But I was even tempered about that, okay? Anyway, it says that uh, a truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. A truly wise person uses few words. They have wisdom. They're selective about how much they say and what they say. How careful are you in what you say? Or do you just babble on and on and on? You blurt it out, do you react? And it comes out. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silence with their mouths shut. They seem intelligent. Even foolish people, if they shut their mouths, they, they come across as a little more intelligent than they deserve. They're not really that intelligent. So I'm, I'm reading this. A, a truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered with Jesus wise. Was Jesus even tempered? I think he was. And Jesus was very selective about what he said. And in my opinion, the thing, Jesus, the thing that Jesus said mattered for eternity. That's the value. That's the number one value for Jesus. Anything Jesus said, he appraised to be worth or, or having eternal worth. If it didn't have a f eternal worth, I don't think he chose to say anything about that topic. So I think about Jesus and taxes. Hey, Jesus, what do you think about the Roman tax system? He had a chance. I believe that he had an opinion. Maybe he didn't. I believe he did. But he said, this doesn't have eternal value. I'm not saying anything about the Roman tax system. Just out of curiosity, how do you feel about paying your taxes to the Roman Empire? Oh, you don't pay Roman taxes. See, it doesn't even exist. See, it, the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. That's all gone. It's not eternal. Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything about it. Uh, what, what that scripture say in, Rome, uh, in Proverbs? A truly wise person uses few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. He chose and was selective. But what he said, in my opinion, he said things that had eternal value and importance. Do you think you ever talk and, uh, or you write things on social media and God in heaven, when you write or say some of the things you write and say, God puts his head in his hands and says, oh no, not again. Oh no, not again. 
let's, let's take the pressure off of you. Do you think I've ever said anything and God puts his head in his hands and says, oh, no, not again? Of course, right? We all say things that are ridiculous sometimes or not, not what God wants or not having eternal value. This is what we read the Apostle Paul writing and it's something that Jesus lived by. Paul wrote it, but Jesus, this is how Jesus lived. I love this line. It says in the uh, second chapter of 2 Timothy, again, Paul writing, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. Have you ever had a foolish, ignorant argument that started fights, that's created unnecessary conflict about something that wasn't eternal in nature. Have you ever had a foolish argument? I'll prove it to you. Some of you say, no, 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 don't think I've been there, done that. Okay, so I have a video. This will prove it to you. Here we go. Do anybody else's kids fight over literally everything? My kids can spend 20 minutes arguing till their heads are about to explode over who's going to sleep at the top bunk bed, and they don't even have a bunk bed. For real. I mean, they would fight over a piece of garbage like it is the most important thing in the world. Honestly, the person who invented packs of bowls in different colors is evil. And definitely does not have kids because guess what? They all want the yellow one. And of course, there's only one yellow bowl in the whole pack. But honey, what is so wrong with a green bowl? It's just a bowl. I want the yellow one. But I want the yellow one. No, but I want the yellow one. Seriously? And the thing that gets me the most is when they try to involve me in their stupid arguments. Mommy, I wanted the yellow bowl and she took it. I don't care. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody here who's a parent, have you ever observed your children having ridiculous arguments? Anybody? Now, here's the point. Has anybody here in the room ever been a child? We've all been that way. We've all done that. Every one of us has had ridiculous arguments. When I was a kid, my parents used to have a car back in the day Cars were really not cars, they were boats. You know what I mean? You could put a yardstick between the back seat and the front seat. Do you remember those cars? I mean, they were monstrous. Now, people aren't all as old as me, so you don't remember them, but they were, and we, the, the, the fabric of the car, the, the, the whatever it was in the car seat, there was always lines. Do you remember the lines? They still, I don't even sit, I don't sit in the back seat of a car. I don't know what they look like. I guess there's lines back there. But you, I have one brother, his name's Steve, nicknamed Bean. I gave him the name Bean for some reasons. But anyway, Bean and I sit in the back seat and here's the line. Guess how it, was, it goes down. You got over the line. You got over the line. Get on your own side. Deanna had it even worse. She had two sisters. So now they got three and somebody's always in the middle where you got the hump thing going on there. You remember the hump thing in the middle? And so they're there and that, now they got to sit in here. And, and every now and then they're driving down the car and, the, and their father's driving. The girls are fighting over who's on which line and whatever they're fighting over. You were, is anybody relating to this? Yeah. And, and all of a sudden the father has had it. Have you ever had it? I think that lady has had it. <laughs> She's had it. She's off the deep, deep end here. He drive along. Deanna's drives, driving along. Bill's driving along. And all of a sudden, he throws his hand back and he says, now look. <laughs> when he said, now look, it meant you better knock it off now. And, and he threatened him with the big five. You know, <laughs> he threatened him with the big five. Now look. We've all had the experience as parents of that. And we've also been ridiculous like that. And, and and you think, well, that's when I was a child. There's times when you verbalize, you fight, you disagree with somebody else, and God in heaven is, he's not like that mother. She's a nutcase. But he, he's like, what are you doing? What are you saying? It's just ridiculous. Here's the problem. How do I figure out whether this is something that I should pursue? This argument, this debate, this discussion, this conversation, how do I figure out this is something to hang in with? How do I figure it out? I want to give you two questions today that you can use that will help you be wiser in the way that you speak. Because if you're not careful, you can damage 
important relationships, and sure enough, 15 years go by, and you're still not talking to each other. You can damage relationships. So I'm going to give you two questions. So, some of the relationships happen. I'm trying, you know, I've been talking about damaged relationships in the past, but now I'm trying to be a little preventative. These two questions will help you. These, these two questions will save you. Here's the first question. This, is this argument truly important? Is this argument really important? That's what I think Jesus could have asked in this scripture in Matthew 22. Jesus is hearing them come and, he's, and they're saying, hey, what do you think about the Roman tax system? Should we pay taxes or not? And he evaluated, is this really an important question for me to answer here? Is this important to answer? Because if I answer it, what's the possible consequence of this question? I could be arrested. That's going to derail my greater purposes here. It's not about this. What's important is not being arrested right now. What's important is speaking to the lives of people. He evaluated. When we communicate with other people, we should ask, is this really important? And if it's important, how important is it? How much of a price are you willing to pay to continue to pursue this line of conversation with somebody else? How important is it? Because depending on what I say, I could, that what I say could result in the permanent damage to our relationship so that we never speak again. Has that ever happened where somebody says something and it damages the relationship forever? Somebody went out of church first service. The guy said to me, that was a great sermon today. He said, I have a son and we're clashing over some things. I think political things. Son has a completely different point of view. And he said to me, I'm losing my son. I'm not gonna win the argument. I'm losing my son. You gotta examine. Is this really important? And it may be. I, I will tell you an example in a bit of an argument or a conflict I had with someone and it destroyed the relationship, but I think it was worth it. You just have to answer the question. Is it important enough to damage this relationship? That's the first question. Is it worth damaging the relationship because the price could be we're never again gonna have a communication. Is it important enough? That's the first question. Second question, is it winnable? Is it winnable? Last week, I, I talked about arguments that we sometimes have, and I was making fun of our arguments, and I said, here's, here's how the pattern of arguing goes. I try to persuade you to my point of view, which happens to be right, you happen to be wrong, and I, I present the facts to you as they are. I mean, it's not opinion, it's facts. I'm right, you're wrong. And I present it. I'm sure you'll come to your senses and, and you'll say, you're right, Randy. I am wrong. You are right. But it doesn't work. So then, and they try to persuade me. Then what happens? I say the same thing again 16 times, right? That's how we do. I say it again 16 times because I'm sure that if I present the same information this way, this way, this way, this way, then you'll be persuaded. You'll say, you were right. You are right, Randy. I am wrong. And then when that doesn't work, then I raise my voice and you raise your voice and then I raise my voice and you raise my voice. And we're, because uh, I figure if I raise my voice and get it, then you'll hear me and you'll change your mind and you'll see that I was right and you were wrong. At some point, after you said the same thing three times, you should ask yourself this question. Is this winnable? Am I really likely to persuade this person to change the way of thinking? If you think, probably not, then you ought to stop. Because if you don't stop, you could drive the person away forever. And if that's okay, that's fine. But if it's not winnable, it's, it's not winnable. Let me, let me tell you something that I would go to the wall for and arguing for. One of the things I would fight to the death for. That's Jesus. Of all the debates I could have with anybody, I'm going to die for Jesus. Of all the things, that's what I'm going to die for. I'm going to die trying to persuade somebody to follow Jesus. However, that's how important it is to me. Because I think Jesus matters for all eternity. It's really, 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 really very important. Okay? But sometimes, even with Jesus, you have to ask the question. So it's very important. But you have to ask the question, 
Is it winnable? Is it winnable? And I'll show you in the scripture where sometime it's evaluated, no, it's not winnable, therefore back off the issue. Here's, here's what's happening. Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, go out and tell everybody about me. And he's telling them, here, go to this town, this town, this town, this town. They go out. But as he tells them they're in marching orders, he says this at the very end. He says, and if a town refuses to welcome you, shake its dust off your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. So these guys are going out, the disciples are going out to spread the gospel to these different towns. But if they're not receptive at this particular time, let it go. Because here's what happens. If I persist in telling somebody about Jesus, and I pound them about Jesus persistently, even though very, 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 very important, but if I pound them again and again and again and attempt to shove the faith down the throat, do people ever try to shove the faith down somebody else's throat? Guess what happens? They got so sick of me shoving it down their throat over the prolonged period of time that I'm shoving it down the throat that when you take a different approach to the same person to share Jesus' love, they put you in the box of Randy. And they say, yeah, I know who you are before you even get a word out of your mouth. You're just like that jerk. I'm not listening to you. And suddenly, not only have I not won the argument, the Jesus argument with this individual, but nobody else can win the argument with Jesus, about Jesus. And it's very, very important. So the question we need to ask, which was the question Jesus was telling the disciples to ask is, is this a winnable discussion? You're going into a town and they're not receptive to you. They don't want to hear anything. You got to ask after you've said the same thing like two or three times, I don't think this is very winnable. I suggest you move away from the issue. Now to examples. And I've used the one before and the other I've used in a way, but I'm going to tweak it. This is the question, is it important? One time, a bunch of years ago, a wife called me up. Now, a little background to the story. The guy that I'm describing is a guy who had been in the hospital. I forget what he had. He had one of those stomach surgeries years ago. And uh, I was visiting, this was a recovery period. And I come, and I, he was an alcoholic. I was visiting him in his home. And I come and I play a game of cards and I pray with him. I did this periodically. And sometimes they'd drop my card, my business card in the door. And, yeah, I was here, sorry, I missed you. And that kind of thing. And uh, so that was the nature of my relationship. Didn't often come to church, maybe communion, maybe Easter, not often. Uh, but his, his wife called me one day and she said of her husband that he was suicidal. He said he's going to kill himself. What should she do? I'll tell you what you can do, what you should do. If a person is genuinely suicidal, they're actually a threat to themselves or to someone else. You should call service, probably 911, but service access management. And they can involuntarily commit the person to the psychiatric, psychiatric unit. I've done that already. I make an appraisal how serious it is, but, and I won't always do that. And if you want to talk to me about suicide, I'd love to talk to you about suicide. You're having suicidal thoughts and I won't immediately do this, but if I have to, if I determine this is necessary to save your life, I absolutely will. And I told the woman, the wife was calling me saying, hey, my husband's suicidal, what should I do? I made a quick, are you sure he's really suicidal? She said, I'm really sure. I said, then, then we need to call service access management, but I want to call, not you, because this can backfire. This can really upset the person. And if anybody's going to have a relationship that's damaged, I want to damage my relationship rather than yours. What was I saying? This is a really important issue here. The, a man's life is at stake. I'm willing to sacrifice my relationship. So I called. They sent the ambulance, they sent the state police. I met them at the house. Oh, first I verified that he was really suicidal. I went to his house and I said, hey, how are you doing? He was out mowing his lawn. I said to him, are you, how are you doing? He said, I'm really upset, Randy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish along the lawn, I'm gonna kill myself. Oh, are you really going to, please, I, wouldn't, I wish you wouldn't, please don't. 
Are you serious? Yeah, I'm absolutely, I've done it. I've decided, it's, I'm done. I really wish you wouldn't. Dashed off quickly, because no cell phones at that time, years ago. Went over to this church, called 911, called them, please come, please come, please come. They came, I met them, met the ambulance, met the state trooper, knocked on the door, no answer. The trooper, I guess, can't go into the house, legally perhaps. I checked, doors unlocked, went in, the trooper followed me. Looked around the downstairs, not there. Went upstairs, starting to look around the rooms of the house, and he was laying in his bed, asleep. When I came to the door, he woke up, and he said, uh, what are you doing here, Randy? And then he looked over and saw the officer over my left shoulder, and he said, and what's he doing here? And I told him, and he, he was escorted out of the house. And as he was going out of the house, he picked up one of my business cards, and he ripped it up, and he said, this is what I think of you, Randy Bond. And he ripped it up and threw it down, and he said, I'm never coming back to church again, ever. And I thought, you, you don't anyway, but he, he, he was determined. And uh, he got help. He got help with his alcoholism. He didn't commit suicide. He lived many more years. And he never talked to me again. Never. I'd see him occasionally at a wedding or a funeral. I remember one particular time somewhere on the property of the church or the cemetery, I saw him sitting in the car, passenger side, the window was rolled down. I said, hey, how are you? Looked straight ahead, didn't see me. Straight ahead. Hated my guts. Was that a good conflict to engage in? It absolutely was. So I have to evaluate, is this important? I'm not saying that every conversation, it's never, it's, that, that we should never have any conflicts, that we should never have any discussions, we should never put it out there, we should never, I'm just saying before, one of the questions you ask is, is this really important, really important for eternity? That's what the father was saying to me outside after the first service, he's saying, this is not important enough to jeopardize the permanent relationship I have with my son because it's getting there. I haven't done it yet, but it's, I can't do this anymore. He's very appreciative. One, is this really, really, really important? If it is, go for it. And then second question, is it winnable? Last year I told a story about a guy named Bill Tate who had a, uh, was head of a mission organization or involved in a mission organization and then the organization was gonna split and, and the two individuals, Bill and this other guy that they were, they wrote me a letter and they said, hey, both of the individual wrote a letter and said, we're breaking away because this guy's bad, this guy's bad, and I hope your church still gives us money. And I wrote a le three page letter back, felt really good about it. Ah, oh, I really put it in their place. I said, you gotta work it out before we give you one more thin dime. And I attacked the thin dime to the end of it. Stupid, stupid, stupid on my part because it wasn't winnable. I had good intentions. I might have even been right. We should reconcile. Yes, but it wasn't winnable. It, it wasn't winnable. It just, it harmed Bill, hurt Bill. It wasn't winnable. It didn't achieve my goal. What I'm suggesting is, let me read the scripture. Let's just go back to the scripture in Proverbs. It says this, a truly wise person uses few words. How do they achieve that? How do you achieve using few wise words? How does a wise person uh, achieve using few words? I think in part, they could ask these two questions. Is this really important for me to say? And is saying it going to achieve the outcome I'm hoping for? Is this why, uh, important to say, and is, is, this a, is this winnable? Is this discussion win winnable? That's, that's what we should ask ourselves. Is it really winnable? And if you do that, it'll, it'll keep you from destroying some of the relationships that we could easily destroy, that we could easily destroy. Listen again to what Jesus says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 23. Listen to it. He says, or rather Paul says, again I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. The word that jumps out at me, and I'm wrapping it up now, 
is a word again. Why did he say, again I say, avoid stupid, foolish, evil argument? Why did he say, again I say? Because it had to be repeated. Because we don't get it. We don't get it. I don't get it, you don't get it. And uh, in the case of that person I talked to earlier today, it was a message for him. And it's a message for you. Maybe you've said something this week. Just this week, because Jesus, timeliness. It's just this week. It hasn't been 15 years. Go back to the person and say, I'm sorry. I'm going to change this. I'm not going to speak this way anymore. I'm, I'm going to change my tact. Try to clean it up. Try to clean it up. And, and be proactive this week, this upcoming week. Is it important? Is it winnable? Guide my mouth, Lord. Give me wisdom. Let me pray. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to use wisdom in how we communicate. Help us to communicate, especially about things that matter for eternity. We pray for the salvation of people in our lives that we love. Give us wisdom to know even in that setting how hard to push it. Guard our lips. Help us to use wisdom. And if there's a relationship that's been damaged, help us to see healing to it. In your name we pray. Amen.